hosted by Mike, the Big Chief. All right, welcome back to the Heavy Metal Mayhem Radio Show. It is March 20th, the first day of spring, and it really feels like it here in New York. Tonight, Dennis Schwan from Sanction is on the show. Iman wanted to hear from him. Iman got him. All right, let's get Dennis on the line. Dennis, this is Mike. How are you? You're on the air. Hey, I'm t- hey it's an honor for me because you know, I get to talk to a fellow New Yorker, so my accent doesn't sound completely out of place. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, you're a little better because you have the Long Island accent. That's a little bit more neutral than the Brooklyn one. So <laughs> you kind of fit in a little better. But hey, listen, I, you know, absolutely. I am so happy that, I don't know how it came about, we'll talk about it, that the sanction stuff is finally seeing the light of day. Two demos from like 30 years ago. Out of nowhere, there's a record all of a sudden. I, I'm so happy too. They were two great demo tapes. Two different sounding demo tapes for people that were fans and knew the band back in the day. Uh, but how did it come about? Well, you know, somebody showed interest in this, or were you trying to shop it around? They just did such a good job, and I thought, this is the label I want to release Sanction someday. And it literally took from 2000, or early 2000, to now. And uh, during the pandemic, I decided one of my pandemic projects is to learn some technology, because, again, I'm very old school, so I don't know, I didn't know how to do Instagram or YouTube or any of that. So I said, let me let me get this stuff up, digitize it, and put a teaser video on YouTube, because I know that the, you know, the world would be interested in this. And um, a couple of people reached out to me, a gentleman named Charlie and uh, Christine, who now works for Cult Metal Classics. And she said, you know, has anybody made you an offer yet? We would love to sign this. Cult Metal Classics would love to sign this. So literally by the next morning, I put this video on really late at night. By the next morning before I woke up, I had an email from Cult Metal Classics uh, looking to reissue this. So it was my dream label. And it, it all, like it was one of those times, rare times in life when a plan works and everything falls in order and comes to play exactly how I had dreamed it would. I'm so happy that it came about too because these were two great demos with amazing songs on there and to hear them like you know kind of you know refinished and and, and, and a whole new light it's just amazing for somebody who remembers them from back in the day I mean how did the whole band come about I know it was like in the very late 80s maybe 88, 89 yeah so me and uh, one of the other guitar players on, on those demos named John Flaherty um, were in a band and it was more of a hard rock band um, and it was a band called Ledestri and we used to rehearse in Massapequa in a studio called Massapequa, uh, I believe it was called Long Island Rock Rehearsals or something like that. It was in Massapequa. And um, he would come see us. This, this guy named Rick would come and see us. And he would always be wearing Maiden t-shirts. And we, you know, we became fast friends because I was a big Maiden head. You know, I had the Fender Precision bass. And I, I, Steve Harris was a big influence on me. All my bass lines were really, you know, up front, high treble, you know, attack and real, a lot of, lots of galloping, obviously. Um, so the drummer of my band, Ledestri, that we were in at the time, he wanted to go in more of a, like, a pop direction, more of a, a like, a Bon Jovi type of direction and then me and John this other uh, guitar player in the band we we really wanted to do more like Maiden stuff and Metal Church and you know early Anthrax we, and Man of War and that type of stuff so uh, this guy Rick was just starting to play guitar and he had an idea for a band and he would you know after rehearsals he'd be like hey I can tell you guys are getting you know a little disgruntled with the direction this band is going if you want I want to form a band and play the kind of stuff that I know you guys want to play, a little bit heavier, you know, a little more like Maiden and stuff. Um, so basically, that's what happened. When Ledestri disbanded, uh, we ended up jumping ship, basically, and forming this band Sanction with, with Rick Sanfilippo, who had the idea for the band. And we could just live out all our fantasies because we were ma- total Maidenheads. I mean, we were collecting all the Maiden picture discs and 45s back in the day, you know, back when you had to put them on layaway. They, they cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and there was no no eBay or any of that, you know. Um, so we started out, we only had one song. We had a song called Stranded, one original song, and and the rest of the songs to fill in until we could get tied up the band were covers. So we did Ramones covers and Man of War and Maiden, obviously. And we just progressed as a band. But our very first show was at the Right Track Inn in uh, Freeport on Long yeah. Island. I, I, and I we did place. all covers. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, they had great shows there. So our very wow. first show as Sanction uh, was entirely covers, Ramones, Maiden, Sex Pistols. Um, and then we ended the, so- the show as an encore with our one original song, which was the song called Stranded. And the-, the crowd ate it up. They loved it. And we felt so great playing it. And then that really kicked us into high gear. And we rehearsed constantly and wrote new songs and, and got that demo out. So that's that's the-, the origins of the band. It started from a pure, it was very pure, a pure love of, of classic metal, you know. 
and you could hear in all the songs from that first tape. And you know, people seem to think that at the stroke of midnight of 1990, you know, heavy metal just died. It just ended. It died. Grunge took over. Nirvana was it. And it really wasn't like right. that. You know, in '89, you know, you still thought this was going to go on forever the way it was. I mean, there was changes taking place, but nobody thought it was going to crash and burn. And you guys are just out there now. You got this first great demo tape out. About a year or two later, you put out the second demo tape. Took the band a little bit different direction because it was turning into where it was a much harder and heavier scene. Thrash was picking yeah. up by the early '90s, and you guys kind of went with it. And you know, it we did. You, you definitely bit. hear the style change. Yeah, mm. it was it yeah. intentional? And it was, it was you know, we, and, it, yeah. I think you know the the next singer, Carrie, um, was definitely an incredibly powerful voice. You know, and totally um, Ian Gillen. You know, inspired uh, just you know screams, but melodic screams. You know, and tons of power. I mean, he honestly didn't even need a PA system. You know, people always said you could hear him from the back of the room, even without the microphone. You could just hear his natural voice. He had such incredible projection and everything. And we were starting to personally lean a little heavier too. Like I say, you know, we were we were into Metallica, Overkill. You know, Metallica when they were good. I'm like, I'm ashamed to say that now, but Metallica know, when they were good. You know, they used to be really good. <laughs> I know, I agree with you. Um, oh, yeah, you know, Overkill, um, you know, Anthrax definitely had an influence on us. So it was a kind of, it was a natural progression, and it just fit his voice um, better to get a little heavier. Um, and it was more fun. You know, we were young, and and our playing got better. We matured, all of us, and we got tighter as a band. But I think it, it was it was more challenging for us to get more technical and faster you know, as musicians. You know, and you could definitely hear it. You know, you could hear the the, the increase in, in you know being more technical. You know, more changes, fa much faster. That's for sure. Easily. I mean, as somebody who's been in the business for a long time, you've seen the changes that have taken place with, you know, genres of music and the way bands record and the way music is put out there. I mean, if you go back to the early sanction days, that was when you had to go around and hand out flies, post them up on telephone poles, you know, word of mouth yes. to friends in the clubs. Did you find that it was actually easier or better back then to draw a crowd or an audience or to get people to know who the band was than it actually is today in any band you're playing in with the Internet? I don't, I don't know that it was easier but I think you had better results because the people you did reach were way more focused and willing to come. Like, I feel like now there's such an oversaturation of information and everything that, you know, they might like you on Facebook or whatever, but that doesn't mean they're going to show up to your show or buy your, buy your CD necessarily. Whereas back then, if you could get a flyer in someone's hand or, you know, we used to go to um, Slip Disc, we used to go to Agents of Fortune, um, you know, places like that. And, and, you know, you were really communicating more directly, I feel like. Obviously not the same amount of numbers as you could reach on the Internet, but the people you reached were usually more passionate and more willing to get direct results, I feel like. No, I, I agree. And one thing I've always said when, you know, I talk to bands is like, you know, back in the 80s, like, you, you know, you talk about the right track in and we had Lamore in Brooklyn a few blocks on my house and there was Lamore East in Queens and these were hangouts. Oh, yeah. You, know, you went there on a regular basis. You didn't go there because, you know, Overkill was playing or this man. You just went there to hang out. It was your club. You, you know, you, you watched every band that was up on the bill that day. Some you knew, some you didn't. There was like a camaraderie. It was yes. like, we were all in this together. Where today, yes. you go to a club and people go at the last second, they get a drink, they watch the band, they go home. It's not like that. It's, exactly. It's missing, you know? Oh, absolutely. No, I totally agree. You know, I, I kick myself now. I cry about, I tell, you know, younger people, I'm, you know, the ranting old men, which we do sound like right now, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm proud of it. But, you know, we used to drink in the parking lot through bands yeah. that now I would travel to Europe or across America to see. But we took it for granted because look, the opening bands were just as good as the headliners. And it could be a Wednesday night and you could be seeing like, you know, Man of War, Motorhead, you know, Dio, except it was, you know, it, and we would some of these bands. I remember drinking in the parking lot at Sundance at, for like Fate's Warning or something. Now I could kill myself for doing that. But back then we were just like, oh, it's, uh, you know, it's good metal is everywhere. Yeah. It, re it really was a, a, a dream time. It was, you know, it was like the Disneyland of heavy metal to be in New York in those days. It, it really was. I, I'm more lucky that we kind of lived through that. <laughs> a lot of people look at me like, I mean, you saw all those bands. I'm like, not only I saw those bands, I paid about $5. I saw three of them at a time. <laughs> we were <in> <laughs> right? with, with beers, you know, maybe people bitch back then. But they yeah, like, and you're like right. And you, you made friends. You yeah. made friends. You didn't, you know, everyone goes home right away right now. As soon as that last band hits the last, the last note hasn't even rung out. And they're putting the house lights on and kicking everybody out the door. You know, we used to hang out afterwards. That was just as fun as the show. You know, it's 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 more sterile now. I feel like it's more organized and planned, and there is less of that that camaraderie and that you know that spontaneity and and just that that hanging out. You know, it's, I definitely agree so with true. that. It's so true. Like I remember the first show I went to, like you know, recently. You know, 
everybody was doing that. The band wasn't even done yet. People were pouring out of the club. I'm like, it reminds me when I was a kid and my father took me to a Ranger game and we had to leave before the end of the last period because he didn't want to get stuck in traffic on the staircase going down <laughs> the square garden. And then everybody's screaming because they scored the winning goal. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. right, right. That's usually the best part. Yeah, and especially it shows, you know, if you would hang out, you never knew who was going to come out into the audience and hang out. Yeah. You know, I, I remember at Sundance, you know, Lemmy from Motorhead, out, you know, was just playing playing the arcade game there. I, I think it might have been Space Invaders at the time. So that stuff would happen all the time, you know. You know, places like CBGBs, you know, obviously that was a big draw. You know, the Ramones would be hanging out there. Bands would hang out. So in the crowd, too, were a ton of bands and important people in the scene. So that was, you know, you networked, obviously, really well, you know. Meeting, but, yeah, the flyers and business cards and all of that, you know, writing people's names and phone numbers on napkins. That was all very, how we did it back then. I know they, they were great times, but you know what? Music is still great, and you're putting out new music. Going back to Sanction, you know, the second demo comes sure. out now. I mean, how much longer did the band go on after that? Did it kind of all collapse right after that demo tape, or did you go on for it? A little it bit did, more? you know, it kind of fizzled out um, for a variety of reasons. Um, what going back to what you said, it de- things didn't die immediately, obviously, but we felt a change for sure. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, the clubs were not as eager to book us, it was harder to get good gigs. People were less interested. Like in the, in the like, I don't know, I'm thinking like maybe 93-ish area, 92, 93, you know, when everything became Pearl Jam and Nirvana. Yeah. Um, it certainly didn't kill metal, obviously. I mean, we, you know, it was still great metal, but it, it hampered it a little. Like, you know, places that were offering us gigs on a regular basis were not so eager now. Because I, I remember hearing the term cheesy a lot. And not cheesy in the hair metal, yeah. but when if you had a singer... Particularly, everyone's focused on the, on the lead singer, obviously. If you had a singer that could actually sing, that all of a sudden, rather than be respected and awed, it was, like, considered cheesy, you know? And I remember hearing those things, you know? We don't want to sing. We want, you know, just a regular old guy. We don't want a singer that could actually perform well and sing, you know, and have, like, training and stuff. That, that all of a sudden became a negative, which was very interesting. <laughs> it's tr- yeah, the, the one thing that always boggled my mind was they were like, you know, you know, grunge took over, and you know, like Pearl Jam and Nirvana, and that was what was going on. And you know, there was no room left for metal anymore. Like you're saying, you know, clubs didn't want to book you guys; they wanted to go with the new sound. Was and I'm like, what happened to the, the millions of metalheads that two days earlier were listening to all these bands? Are you telling me overnight all the fans all of a sudden said, you know what, that's garbage? I'm at the. It sounds like the you know, it yeah. sounds like the Joe's and the Pussycat movie. They were brainwashing them with the music and the headphones. I mean, how did they right? You know, I mean, a, some of them did, right? Not not all of them did, of course, but some of them did. I mean, I I personally witnessed people I knew, you know, cut their hair and and definitely start going more grunge. And uh, Alice in Chains, that was a, a kind of a, a ba- one of those bands that they felt comfortable making the transition, and everything changed. The image started to change, you know, the leather started to go away, and I got to be more flannels and stuff, and the hair got shorter. So it definitely was a thing. But you know, the the real true metalheads, I mean, you can't just flick it off like a switch. I know it sounds. It sounds cheesy to bring that word back up, but y- you know, the true metalheads, I mean, we, we live it. You know, guys like I'm talking about, like our friend Iman O'Connor and stuff, we really live it. So even if we wanted to to turn that switch off, it's not even possible because yeah, we truly live it. It's not just like a casual music listener. It literally is our lives. It's all we think about. It, it directs at almost everything we do, you know, so you can't just turn that off. No, so I, obviously I, we went on and still still loved that music and still listened to it and sought it out. Yeah. What did you do? You know, but in, the, in life, well, you know, it went on. I, you know, another thing that creeped in is we got older too. It all, all the timing, you know. I've always said if Sanction would have started just a little earlier, I, and I really believe this, if we started a year or two earlier, I think we really would have made it a lot bigger. I think we would have got signed to a major label. I think we just missed the boat, and not only because of the trends changing in music and all, but we got older. I mean, I get, from, as far as myself personally, I was going to college, I was working a job, I had less time, and I know that stressed the band out at the time matter of fact some of their last gigs i didn't even play um because i couldn't and then, you know I, I kicked myself now for that but at the time i was a little overwhelmed with work and school and stuff and i just i had trouble juggling it all but they actually played a couple of shows without me um and tried to carry on and but I, it just kind of all ended up fizzling out because of i feel like also because of just you know getting older growing up the timing was there and metal wasn't as good so we were less had less incentive we were less you know the fire was taken away a little bit i think those things all come combined at the perfect time to just let it dissolve, unfortunately. 